Okay, thanks for that tip. That helps a lot. So yeah, here's our area of interest, northwest part of the moon, up there in northeast Oceanus Procellarum, east of Mare Imbrium. So our goals in this study are to determine the absolute crater model ages of the Mare surfaces and compare with past results. Uh, second, we evaluate the spatial variations in the absolute model ages for the Mare surface. And then the, number three is to characterize the chemical component, composition and stratigraphy of the Mare basalts. This will provide insight into the compositional evolution of the source region. So this LROC uh, WAC image shows the Northeast Oceanus Procellarum study area in more detail. The region lies between um, Mare Imbrium to the right, over in the east, and Mons Rumker here in uh, northwest Oceanus Procellarum uh, over on this side. Uh, the black boundary is sourced to spectral unit P58 from Hiesinger 2003. Hiesinger performed crater counts in the white polygon over in the east and derived a, an age of 1.33 billion years. Uh, for, for the overall unit. This 230 kilometer wide uh, expanse of nearly featureless uh, Mare basalt is, um, is high, moderately high in titanium and um, also um, has a Rima Sharp, a reel down the center and um, um, silicic domes, Myron T, and Myron Northwest, et cetera, in the east. This area of the moon is under the spotlight this year with the planned launch of the Chinese Chang'e 5 sample return mission. That'll be in December 2020. Several studies since 2017 have identified a large candidate landing region for Chang'e 5. That's the blue box here. The overall landing region is quite large. It stretches 20 degrees in longitude. Uh, we focus uh, on the eastern half of the box. This eastern portion has been identified by previous researchers, such as Hiesinger, to have some of the youngest basalts on the moon. Young basalt samples of great interest to the lunar community as they are non-existent in the sample collection and can help us understand the extent and duration of volcanism on the moon. Clearly, this area of the moon has garnered great attention recently. Four papers have proposed 11 sites for Chang'e 5 to gather and return samples. Well, let's look at the data we're using on this project, uh, starting with uh, LRO. We use the, the wide angle camera, the WAC data, and uh, WAC derived products, titanium uh, maps and UV band uh, ratios. And also key is the narrow narrow angle camera NAC images with their high resolution for doing crater measurements. So also key is the JAXA Kagio data. We use the train camera and the multiband imager. And, and from the uh, MI um, device, we uh, generate iron, titanium, and optical maturity products and use that in our analysis. Topography is key. So we use the high resolution SLDEM 2015. So of course, to, to determine ages, we use the impact crater size frequency density based techniques. And this provides our model ages. Um, we do crater and count uh, diameter measurements with the train camera, but primarily with the LROC uh, NAC images. So CSFD plots are constructed for each area uh, using the Crater Stats program. And, um, and then we um, derive the model ages with the Noicum uh, 2001 lunar production function. This is a preliminary study, so we will look at other uh, techniques uh, soon. So CSFD results improve with the removal of secondary craters. So we use the classic techniques um, uh, based on morphological characteristics, like Oberbeck, Morrison, uh, Pike and Wilhelms and others. Um, but in addition to that, we look at spectral characteristics. And um, 
we do a check with the optical maturity to assist in location of fresh craters. And we use the iron and titanium imagery to help us locate areas where secondary craters have transported or excavated material with lower values. So our overall process for locating count areas includes um, areas that are nearly free from secondaries, um, which is, these areas are basically between large crater chains. Uh, we also look for areas with uniform crater densities. And as you see on the right, um, we're using numerous small spatially distributed um, count areas. This is based on recent work by Staterman 2018 and Han and Stopar 2020. And they've shown that Mari surface ages may vary within small, smaller sub areas. So, and then lastly, we use um, spectrally, dis we target spectrally distinct and uniform areas within P58. So just going into the technique on the, um, using the geochemical data, here we've got an example area, count area six, 30 kilometers west of Rumker H. And that's uh, located here. And we have um, a titanium map overlaid on a LRO WAC uh, map. Um, the lower titanium values are kind of the cooler colors, greens and blues. And the, the higher, warmer tones indicate um, higher titanium concentration. So through this technique, I mean, these are pretty obvious crater chains, but it, uh, the lower titanium values do tend to uh, tell us where uh, offensive uh, crater chains are located. Got a large one here to the north, a smaller one here. And based on that, we can um, uh, squeeze in a count area and thereby at least eliminating to the first order um, some secondary craters. Um, following that, we, we go to work with um, the overall technique of um, drilling in, uh, examining the morphology of each crater, uh, determining if it's primary, those are shown in red, or sec a secondary crater, those are shown in yellow, within our count area. You know, you just can't escape those secondaries. So, Based on that, we present count area six as an example of our results. So we had 74 primary craters that were measured, uh, 40 uh, secondaries that were eliminated, and 52 craters were used for this analysis. And, and we obtained an age of 1.8 billion years. So overall, with our preliminary results, we've counted 10 areas. Um, we show example areas three, five, seven, and eight are shown here. Count area five is the youngest area at 1.2 billion years. Count area eight is the oldest, and that's at about 3.4 billion years. Uh, now, count area seven is a little bit unique. Uh, we have two counts for that, indicating there may have been a resurfacing event uh, within this area. And we plan to re-examine this area for a couple of reasons, one of which is that uh, uh, one of the previously mentioned co-authors um, uh, has suggested a proposed uh, landing site in, within count area seven. So the main point of the slide, overall, the ages for all areas range from 1.2 to 3.4 billion years. So, we find that the Mari surface ages are not uniform and vary substantially by location. We see a chart here. Um, notice the pink areas are the count areas and we have the um, count area number and the age uh, just below each of them. We color code them just so you can get a quick glance at what's going on here. Uh, the youngest basalts are here in the red. Uh, the majority of the areas are uh, between 1.5 and 1.9 billion years old in, uh, in orange. And then the remaining four areas range in age from um, 2.0 up to um, uh, 3.4 billion years. And they're distributed around the area. 
Previous studies have determined ages for most or all of Northeast Oceanus Procellarum, as opposed to individual areas within the region, as we have done. Um, note that our ages do fall within those previous ages determined. Next, let's uh, look at uh, iron distribution for the area. Uh, the red-orange colors indicate lower iron values. Higher values are in blue. And we do clearly see some of the large secondary crater uh, chains, crater rays that are uh, that cross the area in different directions. And these lower the iron values. These distal crater rays contain uh, low FEO material uh, sourced from highland impacts, as example to the right. Here we compare the count areas to the iron values. Uh, the iron values are an average for each count area. Uh, and the secondary craters, as mentioned before, do restrict where the count areas are placed. Some of them are actually lodged between large chains. Um, and we do place count areas where the surface chemistry is relatively uniform. So similarly, we look at the titanium distribution. Um, here, the green colors indicate uh, lower titanium and the orange-brown higher. So as in the iron image, we see multiple secondary crater rays. And also, you may want to note the uh, larger uh, impact craters uh, penetrate the Mari surface and excavate low titanium material. So again, putting the count areas over titanium, uh, we observe a general uniformity of the titanium values in our count areas. And uh, this is actually in contrast to some of the surrounding areas here. Notice the lower titanium concentration uh, to the west, the, to the southwest, and also to the southeast. Thank you, Michelle. So summarizing those, um, the geochemical data, uh, our iron ranges from 16.7 to 17.6 with an average of 17.3 weight percent. Titanium 5.8 to 6.8 with an average of 6.2. So overall, the region is fairly uniform with no major high or low geochemical anomalies. Uh, the iron and titanium is fairly well correlated. We see that on the right. And then um, we compare to previous studies. That was a good thing to do. Uh, Xi'an et al. 2018 um, did an overall count for an area they called um, EM2, which corresponds quite well with um, Hezinger's P58 in our study region. So they, can, they derived a, a FEO of 16.7, a little bit lower than our value, and a titanium value of 4.8, also uh, slightly lower. But recall that the secondary crater rays were included in this, um, this count, this uh, measurement. So those do tend to lower the values. So I think we've got pretty good correspondence there. So big question, does the basalt chemistry change with time? Well, there is really no clear correlation between age and chemistry at this point, maybe more counts needed. Uh, I mean, maybe a subtler point is that variations in chemistry may represent individual flows or alternate magma sources. That's um, getting a little conjectural. So concluding, we identified a wide range of ages. The youngest uh, area is 1.2 billion years, and the oldest is 3.4. This basalt fall in a narrow compositional range. And despite the range in ages, um, iron only varied from roughly 16 to 17 weight percent, and titanium um, similarly varied from in a small range from about 5 to 8 weight percent. Now, looking at the thermal history, we find that the basalts were erupted within, uh, within the um, overall 1.1 to 4 billion year range of lunar volcanism. Uh, our duration of 2.2 billion years for this area is shorter than the you know, roughly 2.9 billion 
duration of uh, lunar volcanism. Regarding basalt genesis, it's possible that basalts were erupted from the same mantle source region. And if so, there was very little change in the composition over a long period of time. Or if the erupted basalts are from uh, different mantle source regions, then the regions were of similar composition. So clearly a lunar basalt sample of the young age would help us better understand the lunar impact flux. Chang'er 5 sample may alter the shape of the current impacts flux curve. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, great talk. Um, so yeah, this uh, paper is now open for discussion um, and it looks like we have a question. Yes, hopefully I can uh, repeat my correct pronunciation of their name. Um, Nadav Nahaman asks, do you plan to extend this work to other Maria and basalts? What about the Maria with low FEO or TiO2? Yeah, the low FEO regions are, are really of interest. Um, so, yeah, we will move out of um, the P58 area. And as, as you saw on the previous slide, um, the Chang'er 5 landing zone is quite wide. So there's plenty of room for more counting and, uh, and more analysis. So good question. We do plan to do that. Okay, at the moment, there appear to be no further questions. Well, um, I have one. <clears throat> so I noticed when you had the ages plot up with the regions, um, it was, I think, number eight and number nine. Uh, they're right next to each other, but they had very different ages. I think one was like one something billion and the other one was one of the oldest ones, the three point something. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Do you think maybe in the older region you might not have, have removed as many secondaries or is there really two flows of very different ages that close to each other? Well, I think you raise a good point. That uh, certainly warrants a little more examination. Um, another thought is that, uh, you know, the older age could could be, you know, a, a kapuka that uh, was just surrounded by younger basalts. Um, you know, we need to check the elevation on that area as well. You know, it could have been preserved and, um, and is older, actually is older. So that's a substantial difference, and we'll check on that. Thank you. Sure. And since there's no others uh, currently that I see, I will also take my privilege as moderator to ask another question. Um, well, actually, I see one has, uh, Kelsey has a question, so uh, I will let, let her question go through. Yeah, so this comes from Kelsey Singer. Uh, she says, thanks for the talk. Can you give an overview of what processes increase the TiO2 abundance at the surface versus depth, such as if the impacts are digging up lower TiO2 abundances? Well, yeah, I mean, it's possible that, uh, that in certain areas there were uh, higher titanium basalts, but uh, the overall ages across the region argue against that. So, I mean, the, the general consensus is that uh, as we get more highland material horizontally distributed into the area, that's gonna lower the surface. So in a sense, the, um, the surface is going to be, always gonna be just a little bit lower than the same exact composition and depth due to um, mixing with low titanium material. All right, so another thing uh, that folks can do instead of typing your question directly into the chat box is you can raise your hand. There's a button for that. Uh, if you do, we'll see you and I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly. So Mike Zanetti would like to ask you a question. Hopefully this works. Can you hear me? Yes. I hear you, Mike. Hey, Tom. Um, hey. Great talk. Uh, so I guess I had a long preamble that I wanted to, to add to this, so I couldn't type it. Um, 
So it seems like uh, Harry Hiesinger went through all of the Mare uh, units and identified them with Clementine data based on compositional data. And so there seems to be uh, at least a few people that are diving deeper into those specific count regions, like you did whatever P58 and, and we did P60 a couple of years ago. Um, mm -hmm. And so do you see a lot of value in, um, in doing that? You know, it didn't surprise me so much in your conclusions here that doing counts within a kind of homogeneous area as defined um, by uh, the Clementine data, well, didn't really show a lot of compositional var variety, even though there were a lot of different ages. And so I think there's a lot of value in doing the counts just to find out individual events and things like that. Um, but yeah, did it surprise you that you didn't find um, yeah. compositional differences? It, it did surprise me a little bit. You know, having recently read um, Han and Stopar, you know, they, they looked at an area um, to the south in Oceanus Prosolarum and were able to kind of divide, come up with two regions uh, based on a, a cut in iron and also uh, a high and low titanium area. And so dividing it up, you've got four regions to count that apparent, apparently reflect different flows. So I, yeah, frankly, I expected more variation. Um, I mean, this is a testament to maybe the some of the quality of the Clementine data that that really was a good first order look at things. So I, I think what we're going to find is that in some areas we're, we'll see variation, more variation, like like down in um, in Han and Stopar's. Um, I can't remember the the region number right now, the count number, but. Um, and in this area, P58, a very large area, there's just not a lot of variation. Um, so, I mean, the next step is probably to not look at gross uh, changes, but uh, come in with a more precise uh, knife and divide up titanium into, you know, half, half weight percent bins or something like that and really poke around at it. So that that could be a next a good next step. Yeah, whack color is going to also be a bit of a game changer here too, because there are some some differences with whack color and Clementine. Yep, and we're also looking at the um, the, the far UV as well. So that uh, mainly has a maturity implications, which shouldn't really be a factor. But, um, you know, it's a new data product, a new way to look at uh, all of our data. So we look forward to using that. That probably won't be until tomorrow. Yeah.